This anime begins with an earthquake that struck an entire town, causing fear among the people. This earthquake caused landslides in various areas, and a hill gradually collapsed. In the labyrinthine city of Nagan, we meet Yuno the Distant Claw. She attended an academy for special classes, where the teacher explained about spoken arts. These techniques can alter various natural phenomena through the inherent will of words, regardless of the speaker's race or linguistic system. Spoken arts can only be used in the human world and do not act the same in the world of the visitors. While the class was in session, Yuno noticed a girl, who caught her looking and Yuno quickly looked away. After class, the girl approached Yuno, asking if she was busy. Yuno said no and asked what she needed. The girl requested Yuno to teach her about the impelling arts, surprising Yuno. The girl expressed her confidence in Yuno as her teacher in these arts. Despite Yuno's hesitation and attempt to explain her modest skills, the girl insisted on learning from her. The story reveals that Nagan, a city of students and explorers, was built around the center of the great labyrinth of Kiazuna, home of the self-proclaimed Demon King. The scene shifts to a group of adventurers fighting a robot. They combine their attacks and teamwork to penetrate the robot's circuits, defeating it. They were surprised that the robot had reached the city, suspecting it followed a bandit. The reactivated robot was sealed by the adventurers. Meanwhile, Yuno was teaching the girl how to use the impelling arts. They practiced on a stone, reciting the spell that made it levitate. Over time, Yuno grew fond of the girl, and they aspired to a future together as adventurers, especially after the Demon King's defeat. Yuno's goal was to explore the labyrinth and retrieve lost relics from the conflict with the Demon King. One day, while walking through the town, Yuno and her friend were affected by an earthquake that caused citywide collapses, injuring and killing many. A strange light appeared before Yuno, the same robot from earlier, which killed the girl before her eyes. Yuno, traumatized, fled when the robot tried to kill her but was pursued. The group of monsters ambushed her from the rubble. Desperate, Yuno escaped to the outskirts, witnessing the city engulfed in flames. Yuno, traumatized and kneeling, lamented that she should have died instead of her companion. The legitimate demon king was dead, yet conflicts continued. Hearing a noise, Yuno turned to see a robot, quickly using her spoken arts to destroy it with a single magical attack. Wondering why the robot died so easily, she examined the destroyed machine and blamed herself for her companion's death, realizing she could have saved her. More robots appeared to ambush Yuno, who, Overwhelmed with anger and grief, used her spoken arts to eliminate each wave. However, she eventually gave up, wanting to die under the burden of her friend's death. Suddenly, a sword sliced one robot in half, followed by the others. Confused, Yuno sensed a presence and saw a boy sitting nearby, who asked if she liked dying. He then claimed that humans will have fun when everything disappears, each free to do as they wish. Noticing the perfect cuts on the robots, Yuno questioned the boy's identity and learned he was a visitor. He then descended to the city, defeating every robot. Yuno discovered that robots, known as golems, also exist in the visitor's world. The boy effortlessly defeated the golems with his sword, claiming none could rival it. He then asked Yuno for food, but she begged him to leave, warning that even if he was strong, the city was doomed. The boy asked Yuno to calm down and inquired why the city was doomed. Yuno, annoyed, insulted him, calling him blind, and then pointed to the largest golem in the city. She asked the boy, Saojiru Yajuo, if he could kill the giant golem with just his sword. Saojiru deduced from the golem's size that the city's labyrinth was actually a destruction machine, possibly built to defeat the legitimate demon king. As a golem tried to attack Yuno from behind, Saojiru intervened, knocking down and slicing the machine. He mentioned he could survive on herbs and grass, as he hadn't even had breakfast. Yuno mentioned having some snacks, though not very tasty. Saojiru proposed a deal, food from Yuno in exchange for dealing with the giant golem. Yuno was skeptical and asked his name. He introduced himself as Saojiru Yajuu, of the Yajuu Shinkage Ryu School, the last Yajuu from Earth. Yuno was surprised to encounter a visitor from such a distant land in the human world, signaling an ominous beginning. Saojiru asked Yuno about her ability to use spoken arts. Yuno explained that, according to the academy, visitors couldn't use this power due to language differences, while humans could communicate using spoken arts. Saojiru, acknowledging this, decided to stick with his sword and prepared to face the giant golem. Despite Yuno's warnings about the risk of death, Saojiru stated that not fighting wasn't an option, as the machine would destroy other human lands if left unchecked. Saojiru quickly engaged the horde of machines targeting him, fighting his way to the giant golem. The golem's powerful ground strike caused an earthquake, startling Yuno. She was amazed by Saojiru's speed, comparable to sound, as he climbed the robot. 
The golem deployed turrets that fired arrows, but Saojiru skillfully blocked them. As he descended, more robots tried to ambush him, but Saojiru used them to his advantage, propelling himself up the golem's body. Yuna was shocked to see the golem using human-like arts, particularly thermal arts, firing a powerful beam that destroyed the city. Saojiru dodged the beam and decapitated the golem, which remained active and tried to crush him. The narrative then explains the eighth year of the Iroku era, when Munayoshi Yajuo, founder of Yajuo Shinkage Ryu, defeated a student of the great swordsman Kami Azumi Nabatsuna using Mutotori, a technique to dodge, disarm, and use the opponent's momentum against them. Saojiru applied Mutotori against the golem, dodging its attack, cutting off its hand, and using the hand's momentum to damage the golem itself. The impact exposed and damaged the golem's core, causing it to fall defeated. Saojiru slid down the robot, landing unharmed. With the tallest golem defeated, the rest of the machines in the city shut down. You know, witnessing this, couldn't believe a visitor defeated the golem and wondered why the Great Labyrinth was activated, suspecting Saojiru but then dismissing the thought. Saojiru rejoined Yuno, remarking that fighting the golem was more fun than defeating an M1, which he explained was a type of tank. Yuno asked how he found the machine's weak point, but Saojiru didn't answer and left. Yuno quickly stopped Saojiru to give him the snack as part of their earlier agreement. Saojiru took the food and thanked Yuno, mentioning that it was better than insects and grass. Yuno couldn't stop watching Saojiru and reflected on her disdain for strong people, as they had reduced her life to something insignificant. She considered herself an heir in a world where even tragedies are trampled, with no rights of her own. Realizing she had to hold on and move forward, Yuno took one last look at the burning city. Saojiru bid farewell, saying he was off to find something more fun. Yuno advised him to go to Orisha, the largest country in the world. Surprised, Saojiru asked if there were strong people there, to which Yuno affirmed, exciting him. Yuno explained that in Orisha, there was something called the Council of Orisha, a group that summoned heroes from around the world for a significant plan. She believed that in Orisha, someone strong enough to kill Saojiru existed, possibly even several people. Yuno mentioned various formidable individuals, including Roskle the Absolute, the second general of Orisha, Turoa the Terrible from the White Mountains, Krafnir the Gate of Truth, rumored to have mastered a fifth system of spoken arts, and mysterious figures like Kazuki the Black Tone and Luknoka the Winter, unseen by humans or visitors. Inwardly, Yuno was curious about Saojiru's identity and power, hoping to uncover the secrets of the distant world. After some thought, she offered to accompany and guide Saojiru as a student of Nagan, ensuring they wouldn't arouse suspicion in Orisha. Saojiru, sensing her hidden agenda, was excited and thanked her for the guidance. He told her that by accompanying him, she was now free to do as she wished. Looking at the burning city again, Yuno, now without a home or purpose, felt free to embark on something reckless. Saojiru asked for her name, and she introduced herself as the Distant Claw. Hearing her title, Saojiru revealed his own known as the Willow Blade. The legitimate demon king has died. The enemy of the world who instilled fear in the horizon was defeated by someone. To this day, no one knows who that lone hero was or if they even existed. Now, the well-known era of fear has come to an end. We move to the new principality of Lithia. A general named Terran the Wise broke ties with Orisha, the only Minia kingdom. Terran declared the independence of the provincial city next to the canal of her domain and named it the new principality of Lithia. This act constituted a serious military provocation that threatened Orisha's control over the border. In the territory of Lithia, on the main road, we see a carriage in which Lana, the Lunar Tempest, a spy under Terran's orders, was traveling. Lana peered out of the carriage window to ensure everything was fine, noticing several creatures flying and getting closer. These creatures usually attack in packs when their prey is a group of minias. These creatures are known as wyverns. Lana asked the rider if they would reach Lithia before being overtaken, to which the rider replied that it was impossible if the swarm of wyverns was already in sight. Lana ordered him to speed up, after all, they were close to reaching their destination. A hooded skeleton, also in the same carriage, agreed that the rider should hurry, otherwise, they would be devoured, at least those who still have flesh. Lana asked Higura if he was confident, which he affirmed. Higura commented that with his power, he could eliminate them all without difficulty. He also mentioned hearing a rumor that Lady Terran had proclaimed herself the Demon King. Lana corrected this, commenting that this is what they say about her in the kingdom. Higura asked if there weren't three kingdoms in Minia. Lana explained that Orisha is the only remaining kingdom, as the others perished by the legitimate demon king. 
In Orisha, they consider their monarch the only legitimate one, and the others are self-proclaimed kings. Higura asked if that wasn't the same as what the demon king did by proclaiming himself that way. Lana replied that this was because the demon king was indeed the king of demons, so that title was normal. The skeleton began to suspect Higura, as the visitors were more informed than he was, despite being a mercenary. Higura explained that, for personal reasons, he dedicated his life to swordsmanship and therefore wasn't as well informed. He then asked the skeleton who he was, and he introduced himself as Shao, the Great Reaper. Lana asked both to try to get along. Higura detected a presence and warned Lana that someone else was catching up to them. At that moment, a gunshot sounded outside. It was bandits wanting to steal the carriage's cargo. One of the bandits threw a bomb at the carriage, causing it to lose control. The rider maintained control as best as he could. One of the bandits warned him to stop and leave the cargo, or they would blow it up. The rider ignored this, and the bandits threatened him with a rifle. Before they could open fire, the wyverns attacked the bandits, devouring them. They wondered how the creatures could reach them so quickly, soon realizing that the attacking wyverns came from the city. Lana, seeing them, commented that Minya probably learned to tame the wyverns. The bandits took out their rifles and fired at the creatures, but each bandit was brutally killed. The tamed wyverns noticed wild wyverns approaching and did not hesitate to attack them. A fierce aerial battle ensued, where the wyverns killed each other. The strongest among them unleashed a powerful breath of fire that wiped out all the wild wyverns. Lana witnessed this and told us that this fire-breathing wyvern was called Rigneji. Shalk, hearing this, asked if Rigneji was always a wyvern. Lana replied yes and explained that all wyvern swarms always have a leader, usually the strongest of the pack. Minya had become the first city to use wyverns as aerial war weapons, making them seem invincible. Shao corrected this, by mentioning that if they were truly invincible, the bandits would not have dared to attack them. Lana agreed and clarified that this was why both he and Higuro were hired, as the bandits were not the real enemy. He mentions that someone is commanding the outlaws, someone with an interest in attacking Lithia. Higuro deduces that if Terran is known as the Demon Queen, then the enemy is Orisha. Orisha, the city ruled by the last Minya queen, is not governed by the queen, but by 29 officials. We switch scenes to a dinner among these officials. One of them comments that attacking Lithia's trade is not enough, as they were facing Terran the Wise. One mentions that the imperial competition to determine the hero is a difficult endeavor, and if Lithia launches into total war, they won't be able to face them, yet war is the last resort both sides must use, as neither will benefit from it. An official asked if he intended to commit regicide. The bespectacled official asked if that option was viable, and another inquired about the Aliyah group, the 17th minister. The man explains that he already sent someone to infiltrate the group, but that person is currently investigating something else. As for suppressing the wyverns, that task fell to the 6th general. The official comments that he prefers to leave old Hargant out of the matter, and they both agreed on this. After all, Hargant is going to the Tilly Gorge to subdue a dragon. This surprised the official who asked how low Hargan planned to stoop, as someone like him had no chance of subduing a dragon. The same official asked if he could use whoever he wanted as long as there were no threats to Orisha. The man asked whom he had in mind, and the official explains that regicide doesn't have to be done discreetly. After all, sometimes people die in a terrible accident. In a dungeon, a man asked the prisoner if he could release the stampede. We switch scenes to the Tilly Gorge at the camp of the Dragon Hunters unit. A soldier named Peek tells Hargant that he looks exhausted, as he has been thinking for a long time. Hargant replies that it has been 20 days since they left on their journey, and they just set up a base where they could rest, so it's normal to be exhausted. Hargant drank coffee and asked Peek about the tracking unit. She replies that she divided Radzio's soldiers into three groups, with two soldiers patrolling the valley from the heights, one of them being a receiver. Hargant ordered that there be three groups per shift starting tomorrow, and that they rotate twice a day. Peek accepted this order and asked Hargant how true the rumor was that the Smoky One was injured. Hargant says the Smoky One is usually seen gliding high, but most of the time hides in its nest, making it the perfect opportunity. Here we learn that the terror of the Tilly Gorge is a dragon named Vicon the Smoky. If defeated, Hargant would go down in history. Hargant compared this tactic to a castle siege. They had to be careful, as sooner or later Vicon would get hungry and have to leave its nest. At that moment, a soldier alerted that six shooters were attacked. Hargant was alarmed to hear this and tried to communicate with the shooters. One of them commented that they were attacked at the base of the ravine by Vicon, warning that the dragon was approaching the main base. Peek felt a threat and quickly used spoken arts to save Hargant, 
who wondered what was happening and witnessed his base explode in flames. Plycon appeared before Hargant and asked if he was the general in charge of the siege. Hargant cursed him, and the dragon asked if there were other hunting parties. Hargant refused to respond, and Vicon threatened him again, asking if there was another group besides them. Seeing Vicon's body, Hargant realized it was severely wounded from an apparent recent fight and refused to answer the dragon's question, calling him a coward. Vicon asked if he had ever seen a champion in his life. Hargant did not understand what he meant, and the dragon explained that when a huge group emerges, one that is stronger than all others, it is called a champion. Hargan asked if Vicon had just fought with a Minia champion, to which Vicon replied that it was not a Minia, as he had killed so many that they were easy to recognize. He clarified that the champion favored by fate was a wyvern. Hearing this, Hargan knew who he was referring to. Vicon asked again if there was another hunting group besides them. Hargant replied that they were the last remaining group and suspected that Orisha had something to do with the attack. Upon hearing this, Vicon decided to spare the Minias, but in exchange, Hargant must die. Hearing this, Hargant used spoken arts, unleashing a powerful holy light that materialized a crossbow. Vicon let himself be hit by Hargant, the crossbow arrow did nothing due to his strong scales. Vicon was about to kill Hargant until the wyvern champion appeared from the top of a hill. Vicon froze for a moment and wondered why he was still alive. Hargan saw the champion and recognized it as the Star Runner. We are told that the Star Runner is a wyvern born with three upper limbs, which it decided to use to do what no other wyvern could. It became a warrior, and soon after achieving this, it took over a city's treasure, conquered a country, took control of a labyrinth, and now, it was about to end the life of Vicon, a living legend known as one of the most dangerous and strongest dragons in the world. This champion, under the title of Star Runner, is Alus. Vicon asked Alus what he wanted since he had stolen all his fortune and should have left with that. Alus replied that he was doing what any warrior would do. Hargant attacked Alus with his crossbow, but Alus easily dodged the arrow. Vicon cursed at Alus and used a spell to throw a powerful dark breath at him. Alus dodged the breath, flying frantically in the air, and when he saw the opportunity, he pulled out a customized rifle and shot Vicon piercing one of his eyes. Aluz explains that those bullets are poisonous magical bullets from the Celestial Arboreal Summit, specialized in exploding upon contact with nerves. Annoyed, Vicon threw another breath. Aluz didn't allow the dragon to finish his attack and used an art, causing a deep wound in Vicon's eye. Hargant recognized the technique as the transformative art and was impressed to see someone executed so quickly. Vicon fell to the ground. Hargant attacked Aluz with his arrow, but Aluz easily dodged it. The general rebuked the wyvern for intervening. After all, Vicon was his enemy. Aluz comments that it's a strange question since he only helps those he considers friends. Annoyed because Vicon was defeated, Hargan said he's not his friend, as he is now a general of Orisha, known for being a wyvern hunter. Hearing this, Aluz asked if that was true. Hargan said that to progress in life, he had to kill hundreds of wyverns, and despite his advanced age, he still longs for glory and honor, which is why he was so eager to end Vicon. Aluz landed behind Hargant and commented that's why he admires him. He confessed that he learned about Orisha's imperial competition and everyone is presenting their heroes. Aluz mentioned he's interested in participating in that competition. Suddenly, at the most unexpected moment, Vicon woke up and used spoken arts, unleashing his most powerful attack, catching both by surprise. Hargant was frightened to see Vicon still alive, and Aluz quickly positioned himself in the middle of the attack to protect Hargant. The impact of Vicon's power was such that it caused a tremor that devastated the area with a massive explosion. Hargan slowly opened his eyes, witnessing Vicon's breath being contained. He quickly stood up and saw Aluz countering Vicon's strongest attack with a magical object. Hargan asked what it was, and Aluz replied it's the Great Shield of the Dead. Vicon stopped his breath, thinking Aluz died, but Aluz seized the opportunity to finally end Vicon cutting him in half. Aluz bid farewell to Hargant and went to a ruined city, that city was the Nagan Labyrinth City. If you the new principality of Lithia, where it was a peaceful day with various civilians following their routine. In the streets, a woman named Karen the Prudent was walking calmly, patrolling to ensure everything was in order. A boy decided to get her attention and approached. Taryn asked what was going on, as she didn't have any sweets to give him. The boy told her that his father said she had helped him a lot, and as a result, he now had more customers. He was sent to thank her on his father's behalf. Taryn patted the boy's head and replied that she hadn't helped him personally. Designing measures to prevent the citizens of Lithia from suffering was her job. Just like opening the store every day was his father's job, so he should thank his father instead. 
The boy shared that he had been studying crafts at school and had made a gift for her. Taryn took it and remarked that the gift would be useful, and she would put it to good use. She advised the boy to continue studying so he could become a good citizen of Lithia like his father. After this, Taryn left. Here, it is explained that Terran the Prudent fought in many battles and was one of the 29 officials of Orisha. The 23rd general, she had extraordinary talent and excelled in spoken arts, martial arts, and politics. After the death of the legitimate demon king, she declared the independence of Orisha. For this decision, she was accused of self-proclaiming as the demon king. She had her own armed forces and was preparing to confront Orisha. The scene shifts to the central citadel of Lithia, where we see Terran walking through a corridor. Pondering the war with Orisha, believing she needs to make preparations as quickly as possible. She didn't want to miss the opportunity for total victory. She entered an office and was about to call Dakai. She mentioned being aware of his return. Dakai was hiding in the ceiling and decided to come down, asking how she discovered him. Karen replied that she simply guessed, as he always does the same whenever he enters her office. He did it to see her reaction, and now that she finally guessed right, it was worth it. Then she asked if he found what he was looking for in Nagan. Dakai said yes and threw an artifact to Terran, the Cold Star. Terran praised him for obtaining the object. Out of curiosity, Dakai asked what it was for exactly. Terran explained that the Cold Star is a magical object dating from before the era of the legitimate Demon King. She suspected that Kiazuna used it as an energy source for the Great Labyrinth, and was right. Sunlight passes through the central crystal and becomes explosive, to the extent that it can raise a city. This object has origins in a distant world and was expelled from those lands, so it's normal that it is so dangerous, as nothing is harmless in the distant world. Enchanted swords, magical objects are aberrant entities that cannot remain in the distant world and pass into the human one. Dakai asked for an example and Terran pointed to the sword he himself carried, the Rajukort. Terran asked if he brought the rest of the magical objects. Dakai said no, he had been exploring and investigating, but ultimately found nothing of value. Terran told him not to worry about the other objects, as the Cold Star was enough for her plan. Dakai asked if she wasn't bothered by the fact that he didn't bring the dungeon golem. She said nothing, and Dakai revealed that the golem had been defeated. Terran responded that she heard about this but thought it was his doing. Dakai denied this and deduced that there might be someone as strong as him somewhere. Terran decided to rehire him and told him that for almost two months, the merchant caravans visiting Lithia had been attacked by Orisha outlaws. Sakai commented that Rigneji must protect the skies of Lithia, so a few outlaws were no problem. Terran mentioned to Dakai that if their resources continue to be plundered, even with the Wyvern army, they wouldn't be able to do anything. She suspected that these outlaws, who are starting to become a problem, are trying to provoke Lithia to see how far they can push them in the war. Dakai asked if she believes someone is leaking information about the shipments, and she confirmed it, asking him to find this traitor. The priority is to capture him, but if for some reason the traitor resists, Dakai is free to use his magical weapon. At night, three individuals met in an alley near the town's canals. They were the traitors sharing information with Orisha. Dakai interrupted them and asked if they have been leaking spies, passing them off as merchants to find flaws in the air defense system. The three traders drew their weapons as a threat, and suddenly, a shot was fired at Dakai, who managed to protect himself with his sword and noticed a group of enemy shooters. They did not hesitate to fire again, but Dakai dodged and assessed the situation. With just one maneuver, he could disarm one of the merchants and block a shot at the same time. Closely observing them, he deduced they were from Orisha's secret service. While in mid-air, he pulled a hidden blade from his boot and killed the three lancers, using one of their bodies as a shield from the shots. Dakai, with his thermal vision, noticed the shooters were reloading and took the opportunity to kill one by throwing a knife at his forehead. He quickly jumped to the opposite building, taking them all down without much difficulty. Although the shooters and some spies tried to flee, Dakai chased and interrogated them. Finding none willing to cooperate, he had no choice but to kill them. We learn that Dakai the Magpie is an aberrant entity expelled from the distant world and a visitor who passed into the human world. His reflexes are faster than bullets, he has perfect vision and an enchanted sword. He is also famously known for being insightful, having infiltrated impenetrable labyrinths. He often exploits deep crises for looting, and his fingers have absolute precision and divine speed, allowing him to cross the borders between both worlds with complete disregard for the law. At dawn, we see the Wyvern army gathered. One of them comments that they are there to sentence a subject to death. Probably everyone heard the rumor that a citizen, a nine-year-old girl named Minia, disappeared. 
He knows a wyvern must have seen it and asks who it was. One of them responds that it was Subcommander Luckwell of the Southern Guerrilla, who devoured the girl. Upon such revelation, everyone fell silent. Rigneji couldn't believe it and looked at one of the wyverns, reminding them all that they are forbidden to devour citizens of Lithia, as they are sufficiently fed. Devouring citizens of Lithia could cause Terran to lose trust in them, leading to accusations of treason, which would result in a punishment of death by starvation. Rigneji asked Luckwell for his opinion. Luckwell didn't know what to say, and the wyverns started murmuring among themselves, unable to believe Luckwell would do such a thing. Rigneji used spoken arts to burn Luckwell, then executed him himself. Rigneji warned everyone that any wyvern who eats a citizen of Lithia will be sentenced to death, no exceptions. He explained that Luckwell joined the army a year ago, so all wyverns who have been in the army for the same duration will be re-educated. After this execution, Rigneji left to patrol. In the afternoon, he decided to visit a blind girl who was complaining that Rigneji had been too busy lately and they couldn't spend time together. The wyvern appeared at the girl's window to greet her. She asked if he was deployed again. Rigneji said yes and told her he had just returned from hunting outlaws. As the leader of a swarm of wyverns and the captain of an air defense army, he couldn't afford as much time as she wanted. The girl told the wyvern that she started writing a diary. She explains that nobles who know how to write often record daily events in diaries. If she did the same, she would always remember the things they talk about. Rigneji asked her how she plans to write a diary containing all that information if she cannot see. The girl just laughed and commented that it's a challenge that entertains her. She stood up from her chair and approached the window, asking Rigneji if it was still daytime. He said nothing, letting the girl enjoy the fresh air. Gradually, she tried to touch one of his wings, but he quickly moved away, asking her not to touch him. She started laughing, saying that one day she will catch him off guard. Rigneji told her that a girl like her could never catch him off guard, and she wouldn't be able to touch him even if she tried her whole life. She remarked that he might be right, but that wouldn't stop her from trying one day. She returned to the window and asked Rigneji if he liked living in Lithia. He turned the question back to her, after all, she couldn't see the town. The girl affirmed that she liked living in Lithia. Even though she couldn't see, she knew it was a beautiful place. Rigneji commented that he wished to be like her and then lay down on the floor. He asked if she would sing today. The girl told him there were many people who sang better than her, but the wyvern requested her to sing, as he only wanted to hear her. Here we learn the girl's name, Kurt. She began to sing, and we are shown Kurt's past. After the war, there wasn't a single person anywhere who had known or seen the legitimate demon king. The biggest doubt among humans was who the legitimate demon king was and what he did to Kurt's people. Kurt couldn't see anything that happened, as she lost her sight after that horror. There, she met a wyvern who went through the same ordeal, and both didn't succumb to madness. Kurt believes the unreal song she heard in the darkness brought her back to sanity. Back in the present, Kurt finished singing and asked Rigneji what was happening in Lithia. The wyvern told her he was only worried about her and asked again if she wanted to stay in Lithia. Kurt began to laugh and said yes, after all, her mother is the monarch of Lithia. Rigneji warned her that a war was about to occur and many people would die. This could happen at any time, as he was aware of everything. Kurt said he might be right that many people would die and that her being there is a risk, but she didn't want to abandon him. Rigneji remained proud and commented that, if the war happens, the useless like her would be the first to die. Kurt agreed and tried to touch the wyvern, but he moved away and asked when she would give up trying. Kurt said there's nothing wrong with touching him and lunged at him. Rigneji moved away and asked her to stop, as she might hurt herself. Kurt started laughing at Rigneji's reaction and asked if she could sing again. He begged her to do so. Kurt decided to tell a story to the wyvern, mentioning that when the world began, there was an angel. The angel and the speaker created everything. Rigneji asked if she still believes in that legend. She affirmed, saying that angels like songs. Spoken arts come from songs of the past, and that's why some living beings can do it. Kurt told Rigneji that she wished she was an angel. He fell silent, and Kurt began to sing. This relaxed the wyvern. He is at the head of a force that dominates the vast skies of the planet alone, commanding a swarm whose obedience and audacity are absolute, as if they were a single living organism. He has a special instinct for battle and is deeply rooted in the core of a nation. Kurt finished singing, and Rigneji said goodbye to her, jumped through the window, and took flight, looking at Kurt with concern. We are now in Oresha, where we see a guard informing Lord Hido that he has a report from the headquarters of Mage City. Hido asked him if the affairs of the new principality are already under his jurisdiction. The guard responds affirmatively, as the third minister notified him this morning. This surprises Hido, as he did not expect the third minister to still be working. 
He then asked about the report. The guard explains that communication was lost with 10 Secret Service agents overnight. Hito deduces that they were probably surrounded by the agent's base and asked if there were any survivors or if anyone managed to escape. The guard reveals that none survived despite being elite agents under the command of Minister 17. Hito decides to walk down the long hallway with the guard and asks how many people he needs. The guard replies that for this tactical unit, he will need 64 members of Unit 16 and a group of snipers. Hito asks if Aliyah knew about these matters. The guard seems confused, and Hito reminds him that Aliyah is Minister 17. She is in charge of directing the tactical units and should be informed before him, although he heard rumors that she is undercover in another operation. The guard confirms the latter and explains that Aaliyah is apparently in a remote area where radio communication is not possible, so he decided to inform Hito first since he is in charge. Hito is surprised to hear that he is in charge and clarifies that he has not been officially appointed yet. The Lord seems annoyed that the guards and soldiers do as they please. The guard asks if he wants to send other undercover agents. Hito refuses, explaining that doing so would send people to their deaths, so the best option is to try something else. He explains that to the east of the Mage City headquarters, there is a ravine opened by a stream. He ordered all the men to camp in that area. The guard acknowledges knowing that ravine but explains that it is too far from the headquarters. Being so far away, it wouldn't be a very suitable position to defend against attacks. Hito tells him they will use that position to attack since he knows the wyverns won't see the guards there. He then asked him to inform some fortification experts to prepare a base there. The guard then changed the subject, mentioning the stampede's release, and asked if he would be able to keep it under control. Hito tells him yes and asks him to step aside. He would soon be knocking on a reinforced steel door. Seeing no response, he opened the door's grill and told Nihilo that he knew she was awake. She decided to get out of her bed and asked him to calm down. Hito told her that ten secret agents stationed in the new principality were killed in a single day. Upon hearing this, Nihilo found it interesting that someone could accomplish that. Hito asked her how many men she would need, and she replied that only one would suffice. Here we are introduced to Nihilo, the Stampede, a girl who annihilated an entire army in Orisha without anyone's help. The guard saw Hito's order and released Nihilo from her cell. She came out and stood in front of Hito, emphasizing that instead of being a person, she was just a being and a body. Hito tells us that according to records, Nihilo is the most dangerous biological weapon that exists. We switch scenes to the province of Etia Sylvan where we see Aaliyah undressing to look at herself in a mirror, remembering the words of her great-grandfather, who always asked her to take very good care of her body if she wanted to achieve great things. Aaliyah decided to leave the inn she was in and went to some hot springs, where she met a girl named Yauka. She was surprised to hear Aaliyah and approached to greet her. Aaliyah got into the hot springs and mentioned that she would stay in the village until tomorrow, so she wanted to take a bath before leaving. Yauka took the opportunity to ask Aaliyah for a private lesson. She decided to teach her the spoken arts and took a bucket as a precaution since novices tend to get dizzy. Aaliyah explained that the spoken arts consist of four main systems, although elves usually don't distinguish them well. The opposite is true in Minya education. Yawaka mentioned that the four main systems are thermal arts, transformative arts, and then she forgot the rest. Aaliyah congratulated her for trying to remember them. Aaliyah explained that the four systems are thermal arts, transformative arts, driving arts, and vital arts. She asked if she understood the thermal arts and gave an example of her mother, who uses these arts for cooking. Aaliyah put her hand into the bucket, after filling it with water, and used the driving arts, causing the water to accidentally splash on Yawaka's face. Yawaka asked her not to worry about it, as seeing the driving arts allowed her to differentiate them. Aaliyah told her that the driving arts have four commands and some spells that have different functions depending on the combination. An example of this would be using the driving arts to change the direction of an arrow in mid-flight. When someone masters the driving arts, they can do things like levitate or fly even if only for an instant. Yawaka became excited upon hearing this and asked what the transformative arts were capable of. Aaliyah made an example and combined several commands on the water in the bucket. Yawaka, seeing that the water could be touched and manipulated by Aaliyah, asked if she froze it. Aaliyah denied this and demonstrated by splashing some water on her, explaining that the transformative arts combine forms, as well as giving shapes to objects like trees or furniture. She then explained the vital arts, which in short, are used by healers to heal wounds or illnesses. However, these arts have a certain degree of difficulty since the condition to heal a wound is that the user must stay with a person for a certain time. If someone tries to heal the wounds of a stranger, they won't be able to, as each command of the vital arts is unique to the person, 
and these can be lost if the user spends too much time away from the injured person. However, healing wounds is not the only use of the vital arts. Aliyah used several spells on the water in the bucket and asked Yawaka to try it. She was surprised to find that the water had a taste. Aliyah explained that, unlike Transformers who change the form of things, vital arts change the properties. The most common is that someone decides to turn water into wine. Yawaka asked why her grandmother is very strong in the vital arts, and Aliyah replied that elves by nature have potential in the vital arts. Aliyah decided to tell her that her strength is also in the vital arts. However, her true talent lies elsewhere. After this explanation, Aliyah concluded the private lesson to focus on her main mission. Later, we see Aliyah walking through the forest, and a voice comments mockingly that they didn't know Minias took so long to take a bath. Aliyah stopped and encountered Kia, the latter couldn't believe Aliyah forced Yawaka to stay. Aliyah asked her what she was doing in that tree. Kia replied she was thinking of taking a bath in the hot springs, but lost interest as it took too long. Aliyah asked her not to use the spoken arts to eavesdrop. Kia felt ashamed by the accusation and asked Aliyah what kind of person she took her for. She explained she was sitting in the tree to relax and not worry about insects. Aliyah asked if she wanted to attend the private lesson which Kia declined, stating she hated studying. After this, Kia used the spoken arts to make the tree lower her down. Aliyah, upon seeing Kia manipulate the tree, turning it into a seed and back into fruit, was surprised. Here, we're explained that spoken arts are one of the most complex things, requiring an understanding of the object and a special spell whose words vary based on the object and user. However, there are exceptions to these rules, and this exception was none other than Kia who can use the spoken arts disregarding any of the system's basic rules. Aliyah advised Kia not to use the spoken arts for any whim she had since her talent is to make others happy. Besides, if she used her power for mundane things, everything would become dull. Kia kicked a stone and commented that as long as she could enjoy normal life, she didn't mind using her power. Aliyah clarified that what's normal in E.T. isn't the same as outside and reminded her she'd have to go to school as soon as they arrived in Orisha. Kia turned to look at her as she thought they were going to Lithia, not Orisha. Aliyah replied that it would be the same in Lithia, so there was no escape from studying. Moreover, there are elves there too. However, being far from E.T.A., they have developed different things from the rest of the elves living in E.T.A. Kia commented that none of that mattered to her since, after all, she only needed to say a command to kill them all. The next day, we see Aliyah packing all her things and went to look for Kia. She found them in the center of the village, where Yawaka, Thien, and Kia were. Both Yawaka and Thien decided to bid farewell to Aliyah, thanking her for sharing her knowledge with all the elves of ETA. Aliyah said they shouldn't thank her for that, and Thien tried to convince Kia to study in Orisha. Kia, of course, refused, reminding them that she hated studying. After this, we're explained that Aliyah assumed a false identity and got Kia a scholarship to study in Orisha. She did this with a single objective, the imperial competition that will determine the hero. In this competition, Kia can defeat any rival and even be able to face all of Orisha. Back to the present, Yawaka went with Kia to play before she left. Aliyah decided to follow the kids into the forest. Fien followed them and began to get scared, saying he didn't know there was a hidden path on the hill. Yawaka explained that by following the path, they would find a place from where they could see the top of the watchtower. Aliyah decided to stay a little behind to analyze the surroundings. Since she arrived in the village and participated in ETA's Harvest Festival, she took note of the defensive measures in place but also took the opportunity to try the food and drink of the village. While teaching the elves the uses of the forest plants, she sent information to Orisha about certain medicinal herbs. She explored the entire isolated region hidden by dense fog to find weaknesses since sooner or later, Orisha's army would take over ETA. The group reached the end of the path and observed a thick fog obscuring any view in the distance. Fien realized it was all because of the clouds and asked Kia to use her arts to dissipate everything. Kia didn't want to, but in the end, she agreed to have a memory before leaving the village. Aliyah was surprised to hear this as it was the first time she heard of such a thing. Kia used her arts and dissipated all the clouds and fog. Only then could they appreciate the views from the heights better. Aliyah was surprised by the beauty of the landscape, especially because in the background, they could see a lake reflecting the sky. Aliyah looked at Kia in amazement and commented that she is invincible. With that kind of power, she could become invincible. 
If she reached that point, no matter who could stand in her way, she would come out winning from any fight. Kia turned to Aaliyah and mentioned that the landscape wasn't really as beautiful as Yawaka said, but she was surprised to see Aaliyah crying with happiness. After this, Kia and Aaliyah bid farewell to everyone in the village and left. We see Taryn in her office, where she met with Shalk and Higara. She congratulated Lana for recruiting two quite popular heroes, however, she commented that apparently, it was too much to ask for them to find the world word. Lana explains that surely the world word must be a rumor that they took too seriously. If someone mastered the spoken arts like that, they would be able to win any war. Taryn assured her that there are people like that, and the priority was to find these users and then find a way to subdue them. After this, she changed the subject to talk about Higura, mentioning that she heard rumors that he never lost a fight when he was a gladiator. Higura confirmed this, saying that he was a gladiator a long time ago, precisely 14 years ago. Shalk, out of curiosity, asked if he was a slave gladiator. Terran tells us that in distant regions, there are cities of savages that bet money on death matches. She clarifies that this practice is illegal. Lana adds that during the Demon King's time, many places were beyond the reach of the law. Shalk suspected the situation and mentioned that it seemed strange to him that Slavers would subdue Higara for 14 years and that he would be considered invincible. Terran agreed with this and asked for an explanation. Higara agreed and told us his story. He was born in the far west, in a place unknown to humans. In that mysterious place, a human found him in a mandrake nest by chance and took him to a cell. There, the man explained to him that he had to fight because for the rest of his group, it was boring to have to end the life of a defenseless mandrake. At that moment, Higura accepted to fight, and he was sent to the Colosseum. His first opponent was another human, and the duel was with knives. The man attacked him, and Higura protected himself from the blows until he saw the opportunity, and stabbed the man with his guard down. Because he is a mandrake, his blows have a side effect that causes his enemies to die instantly from an illness. It was after the first fight that he began to request more fights. The man who took care of him told him that he had to defeat three high-ranking gladiators, but was strictly forbidden to die without a fight. There he first learned the term to die because his caretaker told him that the idea of the Colosseum is to kill or die. When the confrontation with the three gladiators arrived, he defeated them without difficulty and at the same time. This made him gain some popularity. The man told Higara that he would be sold to another city. Higara asked if they would make him fight stronger opponents, which the man affirmed because there were people who wanted to see him dead at all costs in a coliseum. This was because a legend had formed around him, which talked about a monster. At that time, he understood that he did not want to die or be defeated by a human, so when he was sold, he faced all kinds of opponents, royal knights, gladiators, other monsters, and even villagers with firearms who only wanted to kill him. He remained undefeated in every fight and was recognized as the best gladiator in the world, to the point where now, no spectator wanted to see him defeated. Higura always insisted to his caretaker to get him fights with stronger opponents because he wanted to maintain practice in combat since he believed that if he did not practice, someone could defeat him. Over time, he began to question whether he really wanted to maintain the lifestyle of an invincible gladiator. It's not like he had any reason to want to live life as a human would. He simply didn't want to die. One day, his caretaker visited his cell in desperation and asked him to fight, as the legitimate demon king had appeared with his army in the city. All civilians, including the guards, had done what they could against the army. Higuro was somewhat surprised by the amount of violence in the streets. He didn't hesitate to take advantage of that moment to end his caretaker's life and confront the army. Emerging victorious after defeating the entire army, he met Lana. She confirmed the story, stating that when she arrived in the city as an assistant, Higura single-handedly decimated the ranks of the Demon King. She clarifies that she had never seen or heard of anyone who would throw themselves headlong into a fight, especially against the Demon King's army. The conversation was interrupted by the arrival of Dakai who sarcastically remarked on the unusual appearance of the visitors. Terran asked him to introduce himself to them. Dakai looked closely at Shalk and asked if he was a lancer. Shalk introduced himself, and Dakai analyzed both Shalk and Higura, commenting that the Mandrake, due to its posture, seemed like an unpredictable fighter. Additionally, he couldn't identify the creature's face. Dakai noticed that Higura had several hidden knives and was ready to attack. Terran explained to Dakai that, like him, they were strong and reliable warriors. Their goal was to recruit as many warriors with unique powers as possible to not only defeat the enemy, but also to cause terror. Wana asked Shalk if he was willing to help. The skeleton explained that unlike Higara, 
He was just another mercenary, so if he didn't receive his reward in advance and work, he would be betraying his principles. Lana proposed that the reward for helping would be information about the last Earth, the place where the Demon King perished. Back I started mocking Shalk and took a seat, asking if he was the type of warrior who only wanted the reward to vanish. Shalk retorted, saying that Dakai was naive to think he would work for free just because he's dead. Dakai proudly mentioned that he liked people who could express themselves, but he didn't like Higura because he remained silent and kept away from the topic. Out of curiosity, he picked a fruit from Terran's table and threw it at Higara, who reflexively cut the fruit perfectly, which fell onto the table and split open. Higara, with some ego, mentioned that he hates fruit. Both Lana and Terran were surprised to see how perfectly he cut the fruit. Higara clarified to Dakai that if he just wanted to know his abilities, he had just seen them. At that moment, the fruit began to decompose. Terran applauded Higara's skill, and Lana asked if Mandrakes could use three arms at once. Higara corrected her and decided to show all his arms, explaining that he could use 42 arms at the same time. In the Colosseum, he perfected his hand-to-hand -hand combat style, and his main characteristic as a Mandrake is that he possesses a poison so powerful and lethal that no living being can withstand it. Additionally, he learned from the opponents he defeated to mimic their weapon handling. We switch scenes to a village at the foot of Mount Reishi, where several giants appeared in the fields dragging a carriage. A man approached, saying that all the luggage was rubbish and would surely take longer to deliver. He asked Hughes if there were enough beds for the entire brigade. Hughes reminded him that the religious order had extra rooms, but the food was another matter. This mysterious man was Hido, who warned that he didn't want to see his soldiers suffering from hunger. Later, he asked Hughes if he was truly strong because he belonged to the religious order. Hughes just laughed, affirming that he was strong because he was accompanied by an angel. Later, Hughes went to a bar and encountered a woman he hadn't seen in years, Raquel, who welcomed him warmly. Hughes apologized to her, explaining that he brought many guests. A girl named Nilo the Stampede appeared, greeting Rappel. She told Rappel that Hughes was her escort. After a while, Nilo was glad that someone didn't ask questions about her body. Hughes mentioned rumors that she should be in prison and asked Nilo how she managed to get out. Nilo explained that she didn't leave prison after serving her sentence, but simply promised Hido that she would help him in the war in exchange for her freedom. Hughes asked what would have happened if she hadn't made that promise. Nihilo said she could have fought and walked away as if nothing happened. After all, she was created to end human lives. After this conversation, Nihilo and Hughes joined the dinner prepared by Rappel. Rappel took the opportunity to tell Hughes that several soldiers from Orisha had spent the night at her house. Both Nihilo and Hughes remained serious and asked what the Orishan soldiers were doing there. Rappel said that the merchants they brought were much more polite than the Orishan soldiers and were actually helping her with tasks. Nihilo insisted on knowing what the soldiers had done. Rappel mentioned that Hargant was in charge of that army, and they spent the night because they wanted to defeat Vicon the Smoldering. Nihilo was surprised to hear the name Vicon, as it was the first time she had heard it. Hughes explained that he was a black dragon from the Age of Legends. Hughes took the opportunity to play with the children, acting as Vicon. Nihilo would look disappointed at Qs for not taking the situation seriously. Rappel advised her to calm down, as Qs had always been like that, carefree and devoid of vanity. Apart from that, he always solved the problems of the Order but never lost his laughter. Nihilo began to suspect whether the angel Qs mentioned was real or not. In the early hours, they both decided to go to their rooms. Qs decided to sleep on a bench just in front of Nihilo's room to protect her. At that moment, Rappel appeared to ask the man if he could join forces with Lithia, which surprised Qs. Rappel explained that when the Orishan soldiers left, people from Lithia came to investigate, and they told her that if they helped in the war, Lithia itself would support the church and the people. Qs apologized to Rappel for causing her so much harm and told her that he couldn't help her, as he wouldn't serve her needs. Just then, an arrow flew out of the darkness, and Qs stopped it. Rappel begged the men not to kill Qs. These men were soldiers from Lithia, and they revealed to Rappel that Qs had dealings with Orisha. Qs pushed Rappel aside to protect her, lamenting Lithia's decisions. Without hesitation, he brandished a shield and defended against the soldier's attack. Qs noticed that the angel wanted to protect him but asked her not to kill the soldiers. Qs managed to deflect the first blow from the enemy, however, a soldier attempted to attack him from behind. The angel decided to act, and the soldier fell to the ground. Hughes scolded the angel for killing someone. More soldiers appeared, but each one fell to the angel, who showed no mercy to any of them. Only one soldier remained alive and wondered who Hughes was. He mentioned that he should have visited the church when he was a child, as angels are real. 
Nyla woke up due to all the commotion and finished off the last soldier. Rappel apologized to Q's for causing him so much trouble. Q's realized that she had been hit by an arrow. Both Nyalo and Q's couldn't do anything to save her as the arrow pierced her kidney. The next day, Q's buried Rappel. He asked Nyalo if she had ever died before. Nyalo replied affirmatively but mentioned she never saw an angel. Q's told her that he had come to doubt the existence of angels, but was sure they existed. Nyalo asked Q's if he could see angels, which he confirmed, revealing that the angel's name was Nastique the Discreet Saint. We see the mage city, said city being one of the closest to the new principality of Lithia and serving as the outpost from where Orisha monitors Lithia's movements. In this city was Hido, he asked his assistant if the guests had finally gathered. The assistant commented that all the guests had gathered in the morning. Hido decided to hurry as he was running late. He went to the meeting room, encountering Yuno, the distant claw. She tried to introduce herself, but Hido interrupted her, asking her to get straight to the point. Saojiru complained about Hido's behavior, but he ignored it. Hido told them that he wanted to hire them to defeat an enemy and spoke to them about Terran the Prudent. He explained that she had an army of wyverns and often gathered mercenaries or magical items to make herself stronger. Hido clarified that his desire was to stop her before a war broke out between Orisha and Lithia, and for that reason, he wanted their help. Saojiru didn't pay much attention to this and asked about the competition to determine the hero. Hido told him that the competition would take time due to the war, but when it happened, it would be one of the most important events in the world. However, only the most prestigious warriors and those who earned the right could participate. He then emphasized to Saojiru and Yuno that the mission would be a test to see if they had what it takes to be heroes, and the objective was to cause significant damage to the new principality of Lithia. To ensure the success of this mission, one of Orisha's 29 officials would support them to participate in the competition. Saojiru said he only wanted to fight against a worthy rival and nothing more. Yuno scolded her companion, reminding him that Hido was a very important person and he should be more polite. Saojiru asked for examples, and Yuno would demonstrate. Hido reassured them, saying that he was tolerant when it came to rudeness. He then asked Yuno if the conflict with Lithia was very important to her, to which Yuno affirmed. She would ask him if indeed a follower of Terran was present on the day the incident of the Great Nagan Labyrinth occurred. Hido replied that he was sure of that information and revealed that the culprit of the incident was Dakai, who wielded an enchanted blue sword. Saojiru became interested in Dakai, and Yuno asked if the dungeon golem activated because Dakai entered the labyrinth and set off the alarms. Hido clarified that it was impossible to know what Dakai did to activate the golem, but he was still guilty of the incident. Yuno's resentment only increased, she couldn't accept that the tragedy was left as a mere catastrophe, or that everything had been an inevitable event. She asked Hido for permission to accompany Saojiru on his mission. Hido did nothing but smile, noticing that Yuno had very high desires for revenge, and decided to give her permission. We change the scene to the new principality of Lithia. We see Rigneji patrolling Lithia from the skies. He was aware that Kurt would dine with Terran. To verify this, he traveled to Kurt's room and entered through the window. He detected a presence and immediately threatened that if they moved, he would kill them. Dakai decided to step out of the darkness, telling Rigneji that he was only investigating, so he could relax. He explained that he had orders from Terran to investigate the room. Rigneji commented that he didn't remember giving him permission to be in Kurt's room and didn't intend to get along with a swordsman like him. Dakai started laughing at Rigneji because he called him a swordsman, as he was not the only one mistaken. He confesses that he still doubted getting along with a wyvern like him. Rigneji remained alert with some anger since someone like Dakai could attack and end someone from any position at any time. Even if he tried to use his spoken arts to defend himself against him, Dakai remained faster. Dakai would ask him if he knows what a diary is. Rigneji was not sure what he meant, and the boy commented that those books are popular in the human world. He explained that it is a notebook where one can jot down what happens in the day, and knows that Kurt writes a diary. Rigneji would remember seeing Kurt writing in a book and immediately denied knowing this, asking if the Minias enjoyed such a silly hobby. Dakai responds affirmatively, especially Kurt. Rigneji asked where he was going with this, and Dakai reveals that he wanted to know the content of the diary by orders of Terran. But upon checking the book, he found not written letters, but holes made at regular intervals, which is read with the fingers. Then he asked Rigneji what he would do if Kurt recorded in his diary things like the weather or the things he talks about with him. Rigneji fell silent, recalling the time she asked him about the Wyvern army. Dakai mentions that he doubts that he, as a military man, would be so careless to talk to Kurt about matters of war. 
However, he had to rule out suspects and confesses that there is a traitor who is leaking information to Orisha. Rigneji reminded Dakai that Kurt is important to him and threatened him that if he harmed her, he would kill him. Dakai started mocking him, asking if he really believed he could defeat him. Rigneji took this as a challenge and prepared to fight. Dakai raised his hand, signaling someone not to intervene, and asked Rigneji about the state of his swarm. He didn't understand what he meant, and Dakai commented that he just wanted to know if his swarm had been annihilated by the rightful demon king. Rigneji remembered his trauma when he was the only survivor of that massacre. He decided to calm down and listen to Dakai. The latter tells him that it all happened four years ago, around the same time Kurt lost her sight, and asked him how he could gather such a large wyvern swarm in just four years. Rigneji asked him what he would do if he knew the answer. Dakai clarified that he wasn't planning to do anything yet, especially to him and Kurt. The wyvern threatened him, saying that if he thought of interrogating Kurt, he would be present. Dakai comments that it doesn't make sense to interrogate Kurt since she wouldn't talk anyway if she were a traitor because she wouldn't know what the person looks like, let alone be able to identify them. Rigneji began to doubt Kurt. He wasn't sure if she was a traitor, but deep down, he wanted to believe she was innocent. However, he also didn't want to leave his swarm unprotected and go through another massacre again. Rigneji left the room thinking about a decision. We change the scene to Kurt, who tells Taryn that Rigneji got tangled up with her shawl and accidentally took it with him. She simply drank her tea and recommended to Kurt to forgive Rigneji for his mistake. Both began to dine, and Kurt would call Taryn mother. She asked him not to call her that, lamenting about the incident with her real mother. Kurt felt sad about it and asked Taryn not to send Rigneji on such dangerous missions. Taryn explains that Rigneji's responsibilities as captain constantly put him in danger. Kurt decided to muster courage and asked if another war would happen. Taryn confesses that yes and proclaimed herself as the Demon King. She tells that Orisha is relentless against anyone who bears that title and she is willing to protect Lithia from the power of Orisha. Here we are told that Taryn met Kurt and Rigneji by chance as she found them on a mission. She is aware that Kurt is important to Rigneji, as he sees her as an angel who saves people. For that reason, she is afraid to tell Kurt the whole truth about Rigneji. Kurt asks Taryn why she protects her so much and even gave her a private room. Taryn responds that she has a crucial role in the war. Kurt asked if she would be happy with Rigneji someday if Lithia were to win the war. Taryn reassured her, telling her that she has never lost a battle and will quickly end the war with Orisha. Kurt became sad upon hearing this and went to her room. The next day, we see Kia and Aaliyah visiting Lithia. Kia was impressed by the vegetables and trees of the place. Here they tell us that Aaliyah's objective for visiting Lithia is not for tourism or to teach Kia. She wanted to offer her worldly word, an ace up her sleeve that she has and Orisha is unaware of. If anyone were to discover it, she must eliminate them before the competition begins. Both went to a pier and waited until the afternoon to meet someone. Kia saw a boat and went to explore it as she had never seen anything like it. Aaliyah took advantage of this to move away from the area and meet with Lana the Lunar Tempest. Here they explain that Lana is the only person who knows about the worldly word and is a spy of Orisha who infiltrated Lithia. Aaliyah would learn that Lana told Orisha about the worldly word and wanted to confront her. Lana got up from where she was sitting, and Aaliyah told her that the worldly word is just a rumor. Then she asked her about where and when Terran's assassination would happen. Lana was surprised by this as she didn't expect Aaliyah to be so informed about the matter. She told her that she would soon reveal the records about the schedule and the way the Wyverns patrol. She decided to tell her that, while working in Lithia, she recruited two people, Higara and Shalk. Aaliyah, upon hearing this, slowly took out a vial, ready to silence Lana, but she was interrupted by the appearance of Kia, who had returned because they wouldn't let her board the boat. Lana introduced herself to Kia as Aaliyah's former student. She asked Kia if she wanted to accompany her to explore the city. The elf refused, finding the city boring. However, Lana would tell her about a restaurant where they serve good food. They both decided to go to the restaurant, and Aaliyah noticed that Lana was somewhat scared. She decided to accompany them. In the evening, after eating, Lana explained to Aaliyah that it was the people who forced Terran to proclaim herself as the Demon King. As all the inhabitants wished to have their own nation and demonstrate their power, they began to put pressure. Since Terran proclaimed herself, no citizen has stopped celebrating, believing they will win the war thanks to the Wyverns. Aaliyah tells Lana that she grew fond of Terran and doesn't want her to die. Lana mentions that she shouldn't grow fond of Terran as it could provoke an even worse war. Here they explain that Lana in her childhood belonged to a brotherhood of spies in the war and did a lot of dirty work. 
This brotherhood was known as Obsidian Eyes. Even after the war with the Demon King ended, she continued to be a spy and planned that, when they defeated Terran, she would live in peace in Orisha. Aaliyah decided to leave Kiel on a bench as she was tired of carrying her. Lana decided to leave, not without first saying that she would buy something for Kia. Aaliyah followed her into an alley, watching as Lana met with Dakai. The latter told Lana that Kurt might be the traitor. Lana commented that making such an accusation is dangerous. After all, Kurt is Terran's adopted daughter, and she asked how he knows she could be the traitor. Dakai told her about the diary and believes that someone is manipulating Kurt to expose Lithia's movements. Then he asked Lana if she is the manipulator. After all, she comes from a brotherhood of spies. Lana asked what his evidence was, and Dakai explained that it is Kurt's own writing since he noticed that the diary was manipulated outside of Kurt's schedule. He knew this because he left a fake diary, making it pass as the original. Dakai took Lana to Terran's offices. Aaliyah was afraid that Lana would be interrogated, as it would compromise her identity and Kia's. Consequently, the worldly word would be known. Kia appeared to ask Aaliyah what she was doing. She decided to deceive her, saying that someone kidnapped Lana and they had to save her. Both chased after Dakai and Aaliyah wondered if it was possible to use Kia's power to silence Lana and escape from Lithia without being discovered. In the territory of Orisha on the outskirts of the city of Mage, we see the army walking along the outskirts. Yuno would ask the captain of the group if they were close to reaching the border with Lithia. He explains that they are close to the border and that they just had to pass a hill. Yuno mentions that she understands the fact that they should be escorted to know the terrain surrounding Lithia however, she wanted to know if it was not very dangerous to approach the border. The captain affirmed this, clarifying that the relationship with Lithia is volatile, but to the outside world they maintain a friendly relationship. He explains that there is a treaty that grants Lithia a deadline to revoke its independence and rejoin Orisha. And the patrol they are doing was requested by Lithia. This because Lithia claims that Orisha must take measures to maintain public order and curb the attacks of outlaws. All these arguments from Lithia come because Orisha does not recognize Lithia's independence and they want to strategically take advantage of this to give Orisha heavy work. Yuno asked about the identity of these outlaws, the captain reveals that these outlaws are actually people who follow direct orders from the high command of Orisha. Yuno asked if the patrols and inspections they are doing are just a facade on the part of Orisha to give a good public image, the captain affirmed this, but clarifies that in Lithia they are not fools and they know that all these patrols are false. After all, those who patrol the borders usually cause chaos to make Lithia spend resources and energy until they lose morale. However, they had to be careful with these conflicts provoked at the border, since, with a single mistake, Lithia could declare war officially to the entire world, and that did not benefit Orisha's strategy. The captain praised Terran, saying that she is a good strategist and knows that she will not easily fall into provocations. Yuno asked if there was a way to stop the war between the two nations, but the captain denied this. He comments that the war between Orisha and Lithia is inevitable however, Lithia had to find a reason to be able to attack legally, he clarifies that if the declaration of war were to happen, it could start a bloody battle that will last a long time and will leave both nations in a bad state. Saujuru would mock the captain and his troop, saying that he is walking to the border to be able to fight against a worthy rival, and he would not hesitate to rebel if they do not promise him battles. Yuno tried to reassure Saujuru, telling him that his situation and opinions do not matter to Lithia. Saujuru replied that in that case, he will talk to Terran and convince her to start the war. The captain advised Saujuru not to be so impatient about the war issue. Yuno apologized to the captain and told him that Saujuru is like that because he does not know the human world. The captain decided to tell them that Orisha is working in favor of peace despite Terran being originally from Orisha. This because originally, the High Command intended to designate Lithia as a special autonomous region and revoke the Demon King's title. However, these original plans of Orisha changed radically when it was discovered that Terran was using wyverns, something that was considered unacceptable in Orisha's laws. He explains that wyverns are a dangerous race and force, which escapes the control of the human race. 
You know, upon hearing this, understood that Taryn was not going to back down from her decision and was going to cause a war at all costs. The captain relates that, now that the threat of the legitimate demon king has disappeared, Terran intended to found a new order to replace the kingdom that has existed since the dawn of the human race, this in order to make the war permanent. Yuno could not help but be horrified at the possibility of Terran winning, suddenly Saujiru perceived a threat and asked the soldiers to stop their patrol. Two figures in the distance decided to show themselves, they were Higera and Shalk, Yuno upon seeing them, felt a strong pressure in her chest, her body could not tolerate the great threat and power that emanated from the two of them. The captain ordered the troops to raise their weapons, everyone prepared to fight against Higera and Shalk. The captain tried to reason with them, asking them to stop. He explained that they are soldiers patrolling the border by orders of Lithia itself. Shalk mocked the captain, saying it was a good attempt at deception and mentioned that he already knows that everything is just a facade for the world. He continued mocking them, saying that if they truly intend to hunt down those from Lithia, they can start with them, and they shouldn't be afraid of it, as they are ultimately preventing the independence of a nation. Yuno had a bad feeling about the situation and thought of a way to escape with the entire army alive. The captain ordered three of his soldiers to return to the Orisha stronghold as quickly as possible to report the situation. Shulk would stop this, giving a quick thrust towards the captain to end his life, Saujeru intervened in time and with his sword would block Shulk's attack in the air. Both recoiled from the impact, Saujeru would ask for his name and Shulk introduced himself, acknowledging that Saujeru might be a rival worthy of his lance. In a matter of seconds, Shalk would move frantically trying to fatally wound Saujiru however, he managed to dodge all of Shalk's attacks, demonstrating his agility by evading each strike with acrobatics. Shalk decided to mock seeing that Saujiru kept much distance and asked if that was the fastest he could fight, Saujiru replied that he talks too much to be just a bag of bones and decided to take the confrontation seriously. He acknowledged that Shalk was too fast for him and therefore he couldn't afford to be distracted for even a single second. He decided to change the way he held his sword and would strike first at Shalk. The latter ran towards Saujiru and clashed his lance against his sword in the first clash, both decided to move frantically trying to fatally wound each other. Saujiru found it difficult to damage Shalk because the lance covered a lot of distance and consequently, he couldn't get close, but at the same time, Shalk found it very difficult to harm Saujiru, as he was too acrobatic. As they clashed their weapons, Saujiru noticed a mistake in Shalk's movements and would use it to his advantage, dodging a strike and taking the opportunity to counterattack. Shalk reacted in time and blocked the strike with the handle of the lance, quickly leaping to pierce his throat. Saujiru was able to predict this and avoided the attack, deflecting the lance in time. He was forced to step back and Shalk would take advantage to approach and stab him, Saujiru decided to step aside, receiving a small cut on his leg, but in return, he was about to destroy his ribs with a strike. Shalk prevented this by attacking faster than Saujiru and forced him to step back to avoid death. Seeing that his plan worked, he praised Saujiru for his skills, as no warrior before had lasted so long in combat against him. The confrontation continued and both remained evenly matched, neither wanting to back down in their attacks and trying to keep pace with each other, the exchange of strikes remained intense at all times. The captain took advantage to order his troops to attack Higara, this in order to distract him and prevent him from intervening in Saujiru's confrontation. Shalk asked Higara to destroy the army while he took care of facing Saujiru. Higara decided to obey upon seeing that he would not be able to defeat Saujiru, so he attacked the army, unleashing his hundreds of arms and wiping out all the troops at once. Yuno was the only one left alive and was horrified to see how the army began to disintegrate from the acid emanating from Higera's body. The violent scene would have left her traumatized, Saujiru asked Yuno to flee before Higera killed her. Before Yuno could realize, Higera had appeared by her side and took her hostage, forcing her to take him to Orisha. Yuno had no choice but to ride with Higera to Orisha, 
Meanwhile, Shalk and Saujeru continued their confrontation. In the city of Mage, we see a man gathering in Hido's office to inform him that he has already ordered reinforcements to help Saujeru. That man was Hargant. Hido mentions that he doesn't need his help and comments that sending reinforcements has complicated the original plan and reminds him that he is no longer a captain after what happened. He asked him to return home and if he wanted to help, to leave his soldiers under the government's command. Hargant disagreed with this and explained to Hido that only he knows how to defeat the wyverns. Hido mocked him, saying he's underestimating him if he thinks Orisha's army doesn't have a plan against Terran's wyverns. Hargant, annoyed, hit the table and explained to Hido that the problem wasn't Terran, but Aluz. Hido, upon hearing this, was a little scared, asked what Aluz had to do with the conflict. Hargant reveals that Aluz is on his way to attack the capital of Orisha. Hido mentions that in that case, he can temporarily resume his position to defeat Aluz with his anti-wyvern artillery, before this was made official, a blue light caught both of their attention. It was an attack from Aluz, who had already reached the city and was attacking from a distance with a powerful breath of fire, which ravaged everything in its path. This surprised them, and they wondered if Terran dared to take the initiative to declare war first. At the same time, a soldier entered to report that the army patrolling the Lithia border did not return, neither did Saujeru. He clarifies that, according to the investigation, no one came back alive. Hido analyzed the situation and decided to send cues. Hargan commented that it would be best to release the army to start the war. However, Hido reminded him that if they were attacked by a loose, Terran's wyvern army is probably lurking nearby. As Hido mentioned, the Wyvern army appeared to bombard the capital. Hido advised Hargant not to deploy his anti-Wyvern army and instead only defend the fortress, clarifying that it would be best to sacrifice common soldiers and civilians to protect the fortress. Hargant disagreed with this and decided to go out to confront them, because he wanted to protect the citizens of Orisha, even if it cost him his life. Hido grabbed him by the neck and told him that he wouldn't let him deploy his soldiers, clarifying that he is an important piece for the war and he cannot let him die as a hero at the beginning of a conflict. Hargant said that in that case, he would disobey his orders and fight alone. He separated from Hido and left the fortress for the counterattack. Hido was worried about the situation, fearing that they would lose the fortress, as the bombardment would end the majority and severely weaken Orisha. Hido asked his soldiers to contact him with Emergency Line 7. After several attempts, Hido was able to contact the Emergency Line and informed Nilo to protect Hargant and help him annihilate the Wyvern army. Nilo mockingly asked if he was sure about his decision since his power could affect civilians and troops. Hido told her that the situation had changed, and he no longer cared about taking risks. He just wanted to keep the fortress standing. He clarified to Nihilo that none of this would be happening if Saujeru had returned alive from his confrontation with Shalk, and if Qs failed in his mission, he would entrust her with the role of destroying Lithia. Nihilo accepted her assignment and promised to lead him to victory during the war. At the gates of Orisha, the guards decided to grant Nihilo access to the city. She prepared herself and decided to bring out one of her war machines, which was Helniton the Burrower, a tarantula-shaped machine. Nihilo decided to board the machine and connected to the system, merging her consciousness with the machine. Nihilo was excited to have activated Helniton after so long, as she would finally return to the war. Soon, she entered the city with her machine and moved at great speed thus beginning the counterattack. If you've reached this part of the video, comment the word hero in the comments. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss the next part of this anime.